Hello, and welcome back to um, Steampunk Over Ether, the festival. Um, please do let us know if you if you can see this or not. We haven't done this before, so this is a brand new thing for us, um, going live uh, from the Steam Paper Mansion. Yes, the hub of uh, the Steam Paper, where it all happens, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, uh, I'm going to um, I'm going to uh, uh, basically uh, see if I can uh, track down Lady M. And uh, and we're going to be starting our cooking with gin. So uh, let's see if I can find her. Just switching the camera. And uh, this is the natural habitat of Lady M. Um, hello. Mini, now you're all good little children, aren't you? Oh, hello. Um, it's not what it looks like. Uh, would you like to do some cooking? Yes. Okay. Let's go do some cooking then. So I suppose the most important thing is to put something on to protect ourselves but of course in these perilous times it's uh, fantastic to read that uh, alcohol uh, will stop the virus so um, I'm taking that very literally uh, I'm bathing in it um, and um, protecting the collection um, we, at all times we have to make sure that it's uh, fully fully looked after um, and, uh, and cooking with it so that we can make sure that it is in every element of the, the food that we eat. Uh, so there we go. So what I thought I'd do is I'm just going to do a really simple two courses. Um, I have uh, some pears that were starting to go a little bit too um, squishy. Uh, so what I've done is these are conference pears. I have um, chopped them up, peeled them, and they are marinating uh, in some sacred cardamom gin. Um, sacred is a fantastic gin. Um, it's made in a vacuum, uh, so it's really sciencey. so I like it for that reason. Um, this is the old bottle design, but I, I seem to have quite a lot of it. Um, but I thought that pears and cardamom go beautifully well together with almonds. And so all I've done here is I've made a very simple stovetop rice pudding using almond milk um, and Rostov will love this because it contains all his favourite things uh, including cinnamon and cloves. Bleh. Oh you know you love it really. Just careful not to steam up the camera there. Yeah. Um, Carl says he loves the apron by the way. Well um, it was a gift actually uh, but it's very important to cover up the clothes while you're cooking so yes I've got to wear that one. So yeah almond milk I'm using this one not the canned stuff uh, we have a lot of this and it works really well. So if you're cooking anything like um, a curry where you want to do a korma style, but you want less calories in it, this is a really good way to go. So I'm just going to put a little bit more in there because it's soaked up all the rice. Um, and this is really easy to make. All you need to do is, um, this one in here has a vanilla pod. Uh, I've uh, taken the vanilla out of it. Cloves, cinnamon, two tablespoons of sugar, uh, almond milk. I brought it up to the heat um, and then I've added my pudding rice in here um, and I find that if you bubble it on the stove top for a while it really opens up the, the rice uh, so that one's going really well so what we'll do is we've got our oven on which I should have done earlier so I'll get that up to heat uh, and then I'm going to just mix through these pears um, including the um, marinade uh, which is that cardamom gin. So all that's going in there. Now I know that these pears will definitely uh, cook down into the rice pudding uh, and I don't mind that because you're going to get those, oh look there, that's your, uh, that's the vanilla pod there. Uh, I've left that in. Uh, you're going to get those little hits of, of um, pear sweet flavour uh, and also um, the the alcohol, we're not cooking off the alcohol. There will still definitely be an alcohol punch in this. You can cook off the alcohol, that's fine. Um, but I want that flavour. Um, I really want uh, some of that harshness, that burn, to counteract some of the creaminess of my almond, the way that the starch in the pudding rice cooks down, but also the sweetness. Two tablespoons of sugar. It's quite a lot of sugar, so uh, all I'm gonna do then is put that into my baking dish making sure I get all of the lovely rice pudding in there. But there you go, that's a bit of cinnamon over there, just for you. Uh, Thanks. You're very welcome, I know how much you like it. And then you just want to put that in your oven. I like it about as much as Ali likes peas and Paul likes the safety elf likes strawberries. 
Right, as that's already raspberries. Cooked, we're not cooking it slowly, we're not allowing it in the oven to, um, uh, to soak up any more of that moisture. We want some heat in there, we want to get a nice crisp topping to it, and you know you get those little grains of rice around the edge that go crunchy. So you get another bit of texture. So that's going to go in there, and that'll be ready in about 20 minutes. Right, so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to have a main course, oops, sorry, which is based on a Bloody Mary. So at the back, what? a Bloody Mary. Because don't forget, vodka is a Bloody Mary, but gin is vodka with a personality. So this is about adding more flavours to things. Over here, I'm really sorry, it's some overcooked pasta. I put that on a little bit earlier than I should have done. So um, yeah, it's just pasta, you don't need to show people. Okay, sorry. Um, in here, I have two red onions and uh, four garlic cloves chopped, and I've just fried those off in some olive oil. Uh, and then all I'm going to do to this one is I'm going to add some flavours um, that bring, bring forward the flavours of a uh, Bloody Mary. So let's heat up our pan. Um, and this time we're going to be using a gin uh, that I think brings flavours to this dish. Because the thing is, there's some people out there creating some brilliant gins with all these different botanical flavours. So what I'm doing is I'm using their skill to enhance the flavour of what we're eating. So if you put enough gin in, you are definitely going to taste the gin. So you're, I'm not talking about just getting that alcohol flavour, I'm talking about everything else that comes along with that. So based on that, I've looked at different gins that work with a Bloody Mary. So my suggestions would be a gin-based Bloody Mary, that's going nicely. We don't want to burn the garlic, that's really important. Um, this one's called Black Tomato Gin. It's made in Holland, it's made with seawater, and it's made with Sicilian tomatoes. Uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful gin, and it's made by two guys that decided one of them worked in finance and one of them made socks for a living, and they decided they didn't, <laughs> they didn't want to do that anymore. So uh, that's nice apparently, and hot there. Apparently people are having, are having some gin, apparently. Good. Yeah. Well, uh, so they decided to start making gin, and so they use desalinated water from, uh, from Holland, from the Netherlands, uh, and these uh, beautiful... Um, a really uh, um, sweet uh, tomatoes from Sicily. Uh, so that's black tomato. Uh, this one's called Curio, and we got this on holiday. Uh, it's either Devon or Cornwall, I can't remember. But it's made with samphire. Uh, and so that one's a really lovely sort of, again, that's got that salty flavour, it's got that sea like quality to it. So it's something I really enjoy. Um, if you want, if you like samphire and you like this seaside idea, many of you that I've spoken to previously will have tried this one. This is Edinburgh Gin, this is their seaside gin, um, and this is Harriet Watt University worked with um, uh, Edinburgh Gin to create something that encapsulated the taste of the Scottish seaside. Um, so in this case, it wasn't donkey poo, uh, it was things like bladder rack and samphire, and so it's got a sort of a, an earthy gauze flavour to it, but it, it's, it's beautiful. And they do say that you should chew fresh samphire when you're eating it. Um, and a lot of the times you look at this and you think, you know, are they being serious? Are they, are they, are they telling me that I should, I should, you know, drink Hendrix with cucumbers or, you know, a, a swirl of grapefruit will make all the difference. Uh, and the reality is, yes, they will really make, will, really will make the difference. Um, they worked really hard to get the botanical flavours and actually what they mix it with makes a difference to the flavour of the gin. So it is important. Right, so that gin's in there. Oh, I've got some chilli flakes now. So this is, depends on how spicy you like it. But this is our Tabasco hit. So I'm just going to put a little bit in there. Uh, and then of course, uh, it is a Bloody Mary. I've got celery salt. So this is our celery base uh, for our... Bloody Mary, just a little bit in there, but obviously you need a bit of salt uh, to go in your pasta. Okay, and now we're just going to go in with a couple of tins of tomatoes. Um, you can put in tomato puree. Um, I don't have any tomato puree, and as we're in lockdown and it's non-essential travel is more essential, um, I'm not going looking for hunter-gathering um, tomato puree for this. So we're going to add that, I'm going to make a real mess of the cooker because we all know how tomatoes love to spit. Uh, right, those for recycling. 
Ones over there. Right, so let's carry on talking about the gin that we used in this particular one. Um, so uh, I didn't use either of those. I didn't use my seaside gin. I do like them, um, but I decided to go for something a bit more punchy. So this is a particular favourite of mine. Uh, and this is a distillery in San Francisco. Uh, and for those of you that work, that know the Mythbusters, uh, this, the distillery is actually next door to where Adam uh, creates all of his amazing costumes uh, and all the props and things that they do there. Uh, and it's on a naval base uh, just in, in the harbour there uh, in San Francisco. Um, and the two that I, I have here, as with a lot of distillers, they love to take an influence from the, the place around them. Um, I should be putting the extractor fan on right now, but it's a little bit noisy. So, uh, um, and what they've said is that they wanted to get this idea that um, they were producing something that had the flavours of exactly where they're based. So, uh, the uh, terroir is about the, uh, the landscape, the huge, great big pine trees that grow, you know, 100, 200 feet uh, outside of their distillery, um, all of those sort of flavours. And botanical is their botanical eater. So this one's absolutely jam-packed with flavour. I love drinking both of these, but in cooking, they add such a depth of flavour. They are both fantastic. <coughs> and that's just because of uh, the steam in here, and not any other reason. Um, and of course, it's called cooking with gin. So I am indeed cooking with gin. Um, and um, you'll see I'm also getting my five a day in here. So uh, it's frozen black cherries. Always have frozen fruit in your house. It's much better than ice. Uh, you'll get a nice hit of flavour from uh, the cherries. Uh, at the end, you'll get one of your five a day. Uh, and it's a really good way just to have something uh, to, to eat at the end. Um, so we're just going to cook that down for a little bit. We just want to take some of the, the liquid out. Uh, we don't want a sloppy sauce. Um, and then right at the end, we're just going to add a couple more things. So the first thing we're going to do is uh, we're going to add some sweetness. Now I'm going to use, uh, this one's a muscovado, this is a dark brown sugar. And I really love using this with tomatoes. I think tomatoes often need a little bit of extra sweetness. And this one adds a nice depth of smokiness to it as well. So we're not putting a huge amount in, we're just putting that much in. So just a little bit, just to bring a nice edge to the tomato. And then we've obviously added our um, celery salt, so we have got salt in there already, so we don't need to add anything there. So I'm just gonna add some black pepper, and I love black pepper. Uh, we've already got obviously chili in there, so we don't want to add a huge amount of heat, uh, but we do like a nice pepper kick to it. So this sauce now has all those lovely flavors of a Bloody Mary, and you can leave it there. You know, if you want to, you could put something else with this. So, for example, um, you could make some kofta, some small meatballs, some, uh, and that would go beautifully with this. Um, just put some celery salt through some minced beef, or you could do it with chicken breasts or salmon, or I'm sure that, you know, uh, a lovely portobello stuffed mushroom with this drizzled across the top would be absolutely fabulous. Um, but I'm going to serve it with pasta, I'm going to serve it as a traditional pasta sauce. So I'm going to add two more things to it at the end. And I don't want it too hot because I don't want it to uh, overcook. Um, but I'm going to be adding some cream. So we're just going to add an extra layer of luxury to it. Uh, and then right at the end, we're just going to add some cheese to it. Now this should be Parmesan cheese. But again, we're on lockdown, so I'm not going out chasing Parmesan cheese just for this. And also, we've got two kilos of cheese in the fridge. So I'm going to use that up first. Um, if anybody thinks we're joking, we're not. Do we not? No, we're definitely not. <laughs> we, uh, we got a, a cheese box from the Northumberland Cheese Company. Um, oh, it's a really good point to say we're not endorsing any of these products. We're not paid by any of these people. This is just our personal opinions given throughout. Um, so I'm sure there are other fantastic cheese companies out there doing just the same. But the Northumberland Cheese uh, Company, £26, uh, and this box of cheese arrived, and it was two kilos of cheese, and they made a donation to uh, the NHS as well. So uh, we're enjoying cheese. We feel a little bit uh, better about ourselves. A bit cheesier. Yeah, definitely. 
Um, and the other thing is there's... Apparently you, apparently you can't have too much cheese. No, you can never have too much cheese. No. But if you want to feel better about um, drinking gin, uh, for exactly the same reasons, go out and look at some of the ethically sourced um, botanicals. So, for example, Juniper Green, it's a fantastic gin, but they ethically source and fair trade all of their things, like their juniper uh, comes um, from... It's from one of the Balkans that I can't remember exactly, but it's fair trade. They go directly to the farmers, they buy at source, there's no middleman, they give a fair price. Um, one is a brilliant gin, um, and for every bottle you buy, they provide water to people uh, in countries where there's no water available. Um, so have a look around, there's loads of really good um, gin companies that are making gin uh, that have really good backstories, but also there's a lot of gin companies now using the, the first and the last. So when you distill gin, there's a bit right at the beginning uh, where it's, it's not usable. You can't use it. The um, alcohol content's too high. The, the, everything about it is wrong. And so a really good distiller will know exactly when the gin coming through is, is the cutoff point of that stuff that they can't drink and the stuff that is perfect. Um, and the stuff that is not suitable for human consumption is great for hand sanitizer. So there are loads of gin distilleries, there are loads of other distilleries that are making hand sanitizer right now. Um, uh, we've got a local one in Market Harbour called Two Birds and you can buy a 2.8 litre uh, bag uh, of this where you can just refill your little um, um, pot so whenever you're going out you need something for your hands. Uh, so there are lots of companies doing stuff like that. Does it smell of gin though? That's what I want. No, it smells of alcohol. It's just, a, it's just the alcohol that's <laughs> amazing. So, yeah. Um, and I don't mind that because it's the stuff I don't want. It's not the gin. Yes. yes. <laughs> it's not anything like that. <laughs> um, and the other thing to think about is what you're drinking your gin with. So, um, some friends of ours have run out of tonic. They were drinking it with lemonade. There's no problem with that. Drink gin however you want it. There is no snobbery about it. Um, at the moment, I've only got um, ginger ale... Uh, aromatic, tonic, okay I've got quite a few, there's a few others there, um, but I'm not going to go crazy and get our delivery guy to try and bring me lots of tonic. Um, if you like it with um, a little bit of sparkle, a bit of length, ooh, uh, misses, um, carbonated water is a really good way to go, so instead of going for tonic and you don't add the flavour, if you don't like quinine and you don't want to mask the flavour of gin, we always have bottled uh, um, carbonated water. Um, we've got a question. Yeah, somebody's, somebody's asking, will you put the names of those two gins up later? So um, obviously we can't mm. respond to comments at the moment because we're kind of trying to manage this thing. But we will put up, um, we will put up the details of all these things we're doing um, over on uh, Maybe More's page. So check out Maybe More, which is Lady M's page. Um, we'll put yeah. all that on there. That's where I make jewellery. Oh, yeah, she jewelry, makes, she makes yeah, jewellery. Like, nice yeah, yeah. yeah, nice jewellery, yeah. Nice jewellery, yeah. Nice. <laughs> Somebody else, so sad. somebody else mentioned uh, put if you uh, you know in your sanitizer you could put cucumber or juniper in it and then it would smell like gin. No, absolutely. <laughs> and I'm sure actually, if we had a look around, there would definitely be somebody that was producing a um, uh, a sanitizer that probably has cucumber in it. So you'd probably be all right. Yeah. That's not that one, is it? <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else have lid jenga? Too, too, too small for what you're trying to fit it to, is that what you're saying? Yeah, I might yeah. have to go wild and use a colander that uh, yeah. sits, but there's right, not so. much pasta in here. So, um, it's not me having a wee, I'm just draining the pasta. <laughs> <laughs> See, if I was a really good cameraman, I'd have been doing something really creative at that point. So that's the cream. Yeah, we're just going to run a bit of cream through it. Um, we don't want a huge amount of cream because we, we've, we've still got the sweetness, the acidity. It's just about adding another layer. And also, it's a dairy fat. So what we're actually doing is also, we love fat. Um, I particularly love fat, obviously. But um, our bodies love it as well. And we love that texture uh, in our mouths. We love the coating it gives us. So this makes flavour go really well in our mouths. I haven't put too much in, so we haven't got it curdling. And then I'm going to add a little bit of cheese. <laughs> so there's a little bit of cheese going through there. And this, um, you could put your cheese on at the end if you wanted to, but I like it through the sauce because now it's starting to melt. And you're starting to get a, a, a cheese sauce. You've got cream, you've got cheese. 
Can you see that starting to uh, just to melt into the sauce there? So it's going to be beautiful and sort of stringy and it'll stick to the pasta beautifully. So that's everything, but um, obviously there's one more important thing to do. Just got to taste it to make sure that we've got the flavours right. Yeah, it's got a little bit, a little hint of heat. Do you want a second opinion? Definitely. Oh, okay. <laughs> Are you okay to use my spoon? Yes, I think oh, so. Oh, no, actually, I better not double do, can I? <laughs> oh, it's like I don't watch MasterChef. Uh, somebody's saying, can you use mascarpone instead of cream? Oh, absolutely. Mascarpone would be beautiful with this. Um, mm, that's, that's very nice. Yeah, because you get mm. that, that extra cheesy kick to yep. it. Um, mascarpone is brilliant. Mm -hmm. If I add some in, definitely. Mm. So, that's all lovely. So, all we're going to do then is put our pasta through it. Um, I think you're making everybody hungry. Um, it's not the most beautiful looking dish, it must be said. The, the flex that you're getting through there is the cheese. So you're starting to get sort of little balls of cheese coming through there. Um, and that's it. That will be lunch. So what was that again? Just remind us. Um, so this one is Bloody Mary uh, pasta. Um, we have uh, two onions. Uh, we have four garlic cloves. We've then added to it um, quite a large portion of gin. Um, <laughs> which you can definitely get a flavour of. There's definitely still a flavour of gin. We haven't completely annihilated it. Mm. Um, uh, and then we've added to that celery salt, uh, chilli flakes, two tins of tomatoes, um, some black pepper, uh, and right at the end we've added some cream, mascarpone can be used, um, and then uh, cheese. And sugar? Oh yes, of course, yeah, there was some, some brown sugar. Yeah. You don't have to add the sugar, I just like, whenever I cook tomatoes, I like to add a little bit of sweetness. If I'd have put the tomato puree through it, I probably wouldn't have used the sugar because you tend to get more of a sweetness with that. Um, the same with passata, I tend to get a bit more sweetness with that as well. Um, so um, the little bit of cream we've got left over, because we never have cream in the house, no. uh, the little bit of cream we have left over, we can stir through the rice pudding. So that will make it even more creamy, even nicer. That's just starting to bubble. Would you like to see rice pudding bubbling? Is that interesting? Yes, go on then, but I can't get too close on no, this. Lens will steam yeah, up. Yeah, steam up. Okay. It's just, um, uh, it's not going brown yet, but it's starting to bubble around the edge. You see, it's starting to get a nice bubble there. Uh, and it's definitely firming up and going crispy on the top. That'll go nice and brown. And like I say, I'll run a bit of cream through that at the end. Uh, and there you go, a nice two course meal. When I started thinking about doing cooking with gin uh, yesterday, um, I went through the house and looked at all the things that we could have used. So um, loads and loads of ideas for you. We, um, we've got a melon in the fridge uh, that I use um, over um, muesli for breakfast with uh, um, yogurt. That um, very finely chopped up and then put into a blender with gin, you can make a granita and because you're putting liquid in with the, uh, the melon, you can actually freeze it, but you're not going to get a hard freeze. So you're going to get that really nice sort of fruity, soft um, gin. You can add a little bit of sugar if you want, which again uh, will mean that the, the freeze will work uh, a little bit harder, but that would be really nice as well. Um, and there's loads of different ways you could just add it to um, simple sauces and uh, breakfast items. So um, uh, you can make a, we've got a, loads and loads of tangerines so i thought about making an orange uh, curd that you do with gin and there's loads of really nice gins that go really nicely with those citrus flavors obviously gin and citrus go really well together so that's another nice one that you can think about um if anybody's got any questions please do shout i'm more than happy to answer any questions uh, other than that i think i'm uh, i've cooked with gin and where will we find the recipes and more ideas uh, so um, I can post them on, uh, actually it's much easier just to leave everything in one place, isn't it? So should I just leave everything on Steam mm, paper? Yeah. yeah. So what I'll do is, I can't do it instantly, uh, but what I'll do this afternoon is um, I will type up all of the recipes, I will give links to all of the gins, um, and you can uh, have a look at everything that I've cooked. If you've got any questions for ideas for recipes, I'm more than happy to answer any of them. Great. So that's the, that's the lovely uh, Lady M there presenting uh, cooking with gin. Yes, she's getting back to her gin now, I can see, I can see, yes. 
There it goes. There it goes. It's going down. Um, so, um, yes, thank you for watching. Uh, we will be uh, presenting the history of gin in just a couple of seconds, but unfortunately we've got to change computers, so we're going to have to stop being live for a couple of moments, and then we'll come back. Um, Hello, um, and we're back again. Um, sorry about the uh, break there between our, our cooking with gin and our next uh, gin-based uh, segment. Um, I had to walk from uh, one part of the uh, steam paper mansion to another, um, so you know it was quite a quite a bit of a walk there between those. So uh, anyway, coming up later, we've got all sorts of things. I'll just talk about those briefly um, while I'm waiting for people to join us. Uh, I'm sure they're having uh, similar um, treks from one part of the um, one part of their mansion to another part of their mansion. Um, so coming up later um, after this, uh, well, right to where are we? Just looking at my thing. Coming up at um, four o'clock, we've got some uh, talks about comic books. We've got a fabulous animated comic book. That's a real first. Um, it should be really interesting. should be really good. Um, what else have we got? Um, and we've got Captain Cup of Tea as well uh, with three fabulous videos from him. Um, all, uh, mostly tea-based, actually, which is good because coming up at five o'clock today, um, we have um, what might be the world's first virtual tea dueling um competition or, or contest or demonstration whatever you might like to call it but anyway we're going to try that and we're going to see how it goes and then we're going to be joining um dr jeff for some live portraiture if we can sort it all out so right so uh, without further ado i can see some of you watching now so hopefully you've caught up i'm going to uh, uh allow um dr kate vigors from history's made to tell you all about the history of gin Any of you got any gin? No, not one of you. Well, what about a penny for an old girl down on her luck? Ah, come on, I'm begging you. Oh, well, that's a tot of gin. I mean, it's not much to ask, is it? Who don't love gin? Mother's ruin, you say? <laughs> I imagine you want me to tell you the great and illustrious history of our nation's favourite tipple. All right. And it shall come straight from the horse's mouth, so to speak. For I was once a purveyor of the finest gin in London. Now, gin gets its name from the Dutch word for juniper, which is Genève. For indeed it is juniper, that humble conifer, that tree of twisted trunk and gnarled bough, that sets gin apart from all other types of liquor. For juniper must be the pervading botanical and flavour for a liquor to be classed as gin. Can't say I was too worried about that when I was still in my own stuff, to be honest. As long as it's strong and it's the spot. Now, apparently, and here's the clever bit, gin's core ingredient, juniper, as we already know, has been combined with alcohol as back as far as, ooh, 70 AD. A very clever chap, a physician, he was called, uh, oh, God, what was it? Pandias Disacoria, anyway, him. He published a five-volume encyclopedia about herbal medicine, and in one of them he describes using juniper berries steeped in wine to combat chest ailments. <coughs> <coughs> Knew it. Then in 1055, the Benedictine monks in Italy included a recipe for tonic wine infused with juniper berries in their Compedium Solanita. 
There are references to a spirit flavoured with Genève in a 13th century Flemish manuscript and the 16th century, or by the 16th century, the Dutch started producing a spirit that they called Genève. Basically, it was a malt wine base with a goodly amount of juniper berries, enough to mask its harsh taste and flavour. It was, of course, a medicinal liquid, just like its predecessors. Then the Dutch began producing gin in earnest with hundreds of distilleries in Amsterdam alone. Now, in the 17th century, here in England, everyone drank alcohol. Well, everyone except the Puritans, of course, but they didn't like to have any fun, did they? Now, by everyone, I mean everyone. Men, women, old crones, even young children. Folk would start the day with a glass of small beer for breakfast, and it just carried on throughout the day. Of course, it was because the water was bad, you see, full of raw sewage and disease. So everything had some alcohol in it. And there was loads of drinks to choose from and all. Cordials, punches, mixed drinks. Come on, are you sure you haven't got any gin? Ah, never mind. Now, if people drank outside the home, there were plenty of places to do so. Not just my booth on Gin Lane. <laughs> there were and still are plenty of alehouses which were run for the poor, by the poor. And there you drink beer or ale, just take the bloomin' obvious. Then there were taverns which served wine for the dentry and the obnobs in their fancy frock coats and their big wigs. Then there are inns which served wine and lots of different food as well. Oh, pork pies, beef stew, cat casserole. <laughs> then it arrived on our shores. It come with William of Orange who arrived in the glorious revolution of 1688. And one of the most glorious things he brought with him was gin. God save the king! Long live gin and all. I mean, bless him. He began his reign by telling the French to get stuffed. <laughs> Not literally, but he brought in a trade war against them by putting in blockades and heavy taxes on French wine and cognac so as uh, to ruin or weaken their economy. Then he brought in an act to encourage the distilling of liquors in Britain, to hide what he was doing in France, of course. He also brought in the Corn Laws, which gave tax breaks on spirits production, mean there could be, and there was, a distilling free for all. So it was King William, God save him, who opened the door to us distillers that might like to set up. And the good thing is, this meant gin. Lots and lots of gin. The bad thing for the punters anyway was that the act didn't have any guidelines attached to it so there was no regulating of the gin or its distillers. Anyone, and I mean anyone, could set up a distillery and by the 1730s there were 1,499 distillers in London plus me, all of them producing hard liquor or gin. As I said, Gin's proper name is Genève. The first known written use of the word gin appears in a 1714 book called The Fable of Bees by Bernard Mandeville. He said, the infamous liquor, the name which derived from juniper berries and Dutch, is now by frequent use shrank into a molar symbol, intoxicating gin. <laughs> I reckon that everyone was too drunk to pronounce Genève, so they abbreviated it to gen or gin. <clears throat> <clears throat> anyway, do excuse me. <coughs> this law of King William's led to the gin craze. Did you know I could sell you a pint of gin for less than I would sell you a pint of beer? Oh, what I'd give for a pint of gin now. But with it came a new set of problems and pretty much everything went downhill from there on in. Gin got in every nook and cranny of society. Here. You ever been to one of the frost fairs? No? Well, when the weather turned cold and icy, markets would be set up on the frozen rivers like the Thames, and crowds of people would gather to explore the stalls and tents, most of them selling hot gin and gingerbread. Oh. Enterprising Londoners made a quick shilling or two out of the punters, and they cared not how good or bad the gin was. The gin... I distilled here in London was fiendishly strong, sometimes upwards of 80% alcohol. 
and I would adulterate it. I don't mind telling you. I'd adulterate it with impurities. Turpentine spirit, sulfuric acid, sawdust. These are things that were commonly added. The tales of blindness, impotence and infertility amongst those who frequented the drinking dens and gin shops and the teeming London slums were not infrequent. But they never traced it back to me. <laughs> The infamous signage above the gaslit gin cellars read, Drunk for a penny, dead drunk for two pennies, clean straw for nothing. The assumption was that after spending a few pennies on gin, you'd be so sozzled that your only option would be to pass out on a bed made of straw. Cheaper than the DOS house, anyway. It's not just the poor that drank gin, you know. No siree. The king brought a load of Dutch sailors over from Holland and then he recruited masses of sailors here. And what do sailors do? They drink. So in essence, the king has imported a lot of people who are used to drinking and anything they can get their hands on. And sailors like to drink this stuff because it's hard drinking. It makes them look manly and butch. Gin, they say, is good for your courage. It's good for your health. It warms the cockles and so on. So you see, a bit of Dutch courage never does go amiss. Now, does it? And it's not just old Dutch courage neither. Gin's got her own personality. Did you know that? She became known as Madame Geneve, or Jennifer as we call her in English. Geneve being the Dutch word for juniper, as you know. Juniper being what goes into gin. Do you remember that bit? Anyway, she appears as this woman who will fire up sailors and souls who are fighting for the Protestant cause around Europe, who will be the agent of providence and prove that God has chosen Britain as its favourite nation by providing them with gin. God bless gin and God bless Madame Geneve. And all who's sailing. <laughs> it's not the sailors though, gin got everywhere. As industry grew and new machines got invented and people started to flock to the cities for work in the mills and factories, while well, London, it just sucked in all these people from the countryside. Men looking to earn a few bob. Women coming to be servants and maids. Well, those girls, they're going to meet men, aren't they? Particularly sailors. And I mean, who doesn't love a sailor? <laughs> and they got sucked into the hard drinking culture as well because it was a fashionable thing to do. So fashionable that by the 1730s there were over 6,000 houses in London openly selling gin to the general public. You could get your gin at street markets, grocers, chandlers, barbers and of course brothels. In one notorious district of London, out of 2,000 houses, more than 600 were involved in the making or selling of gin. Soon the average gin consumption reached an average of over 6 gallons per person per year. You see, we poor, got nothing else, have we? Gin takes our mind off it all, you see. We live in filth, unimaginable to the likes of you. There are whole families forced to live in single rooms within ramshackle tenements or in damp cellars with no sanitation or fresh air, see? Mouldy beds, paint peeling off the walls, damp streaming down them too. We drink water that's contaminated with raw sewage and the refuse that's left rotting in the street. Even the dead causes harm, adding to the stench and decay. Most London graveyards are overflowing and coffins are sometimes left partially uncovered in the poor holes. For us, gin is more than drink. It sates hunger pangs. It offers relief from the perpetual cold and is a blessed escape from the brutal drudgery of life in the slums and streets. It's a cheap thrill, you see. It can be had for pennies on any decrepit old street corner. The people of London, though, they began to go either totally insane or just die. Thomas Fielding, a social historian, writes about us inferior people. In 1751, his political pamphlet, Inquiry into the Causes of the Late Increase of Robbers, said, mm -mm. A new kind of drunkenness, unknown to our ancestors, is lately sprung upon us, and which, if not put a stop to, will infallibly destroy a great part of the inferior people. The drunkenness I here intend to is by this poison called gin, the principal sustenance, if it may be so called, of more than a hundred thousand people in this metropolis. As a means of getting the country's gin obsessed drunkards to tone it down a bit, a distiller's licence was introduced in 1736, raising the price of a licence to 50 quid, 
totally beyond the capacity of, well, anyone other than the big distillers who aren't interested in that kind of money. Only two official licenses were issued in the next seven years. I lost mine. I don't have that kind of money. I've been down on my luck ever since. I even held a funeral mass for Mother Jennifer and I mourn her loss to this day. I couldn't keep going, you see, because of the informers. They told on people. You could earn a fiver by grassing on an illegal trader. The thing is, the informers got beaten up, but the juries refused to convict those illegal gin sellers so that by 1738 they dead-lettered the entire act. They just couldn't take anyone to get it to take it seriously. I mean, the justices wouldn't enforce it as they were afraid it might happen. People were let off for breaking the rules and the government couldn't keep control. There were even street riots. And one of the cries that came out again and again was, no gin, no king. No gin, no king. When the act in 1736 came around, all the ideas that had been associated with gin and the benefits of the drink come to a head. And there were loads of ballads and poems printed in praise of gin. Also, it's got so many health effects. It's so good for you because it counters the evil effects of too much tea drinking. So now you know. If you drink too much tea and you're made ill by your tea addiction, you can turn to gin to make you better. So now it's sold as a cure-all. And one of the ways in which gin sellers get round the implications of the act is to sell it as a medicine. You are drinking it for its health benefits. That's the way the middle and upper class women justify their drinking. If Queen Anne can drink it, anyone can. But then things took a strange turn in 1751. William Hogarth, an artist and satirist, did an etching called Beer Street, in which he showed all the fun and safety of beer drinking. He set this against another terrible image called Gin Lane, in which it showed the perceived depravity of gin drinkers in a gathering of all terrible stories. There's suicide, there's madness, women are so busy with their luxuries that they ignore their children. The dying man in his soldier's coat shows that we are going to lose all of our troops to gin. Then there's the woman at the front. The one dropping her baby over the side of the staircase. Some say she was inspired by Judas Defoe, a silk thread spinner from Spitalfields. Defoe was supposedly driven so utterly mad by her gin addiction that in 1734 she took her two-year-old daughter Mary to a field with a friend named Suki. The two women removed all of the toddler's clothes and abandoned her in a ditch. The pair then proceeded to sell the clothing for money to purchase a quartern of gin. Poor Mary died, no doubt of exposure, cold and starvation, and her mother, once she was caught, was promptly sentenced to death by hanging. Then there's all the other things in there, isn't there? There's the pawn shop and the old uh, coffin-shaped sign above the shop there. There's people begging, gnawing at bones, doing anything they can to survive. There's a man beating himself over the head with some bellows while toting a baby impaled on a spike. There's a suicidal barber and lots and lots of syphilitic sores, amongst other charming things. Gin Lane vilified gin and they blamed it for the death of thousands of people by overindulgence, murder, negligence and insanity. This brought about more measures to outlaw its production and consumption, but to little avail. The print was accompanied by a verse from James Townley. Gin, cursed fiend, with fury fraught, makes human race a prey. It enters by a deadly draught and steals our lives away. Now, in 1751, the Gin Act was passed. The idea was to crack down on spirits consumption. With raised taxes and fees for retailers, licenses became even harder to come by. In addition to beer, the consumption of tea was promoted. I remember a moment ago I just said how bad tea was for you, but suddenly it's good for you because it requires freshly boiled water, can be drunk by the masses from the richest estates to the poorest dwellings. The growth of our cities, they say, can be put down pure and simple to tea. 
The bad water and the gin, they say, caused illness, disease, even death. But tea, with its freshly boiled water and natural goodness, allows the working classes to live cheek by jowl with our arm. There are those, of course, who say that the poor shouldn't drink tea at all, but I reckon those people are more concerned with their profits than they are with the health of the working classes. Here, I think I might have just thought of a new niche. Maybe I could become a tea seller. Oh, there must be loads of ways to adulterate that. Getting the dried leaves out the back of them posh houses by the maids. And of course, there's colourings, isn't there? Copper, copper carbonate. That'll make it greener. And lead sulphate, it'll make it blacker, won't it? I bet we could mix some sort of dung into it as well to make it really go far. <laughs> you see, the gin act has all but wiped out the little sellers like me. The chandlers, shops, the market ladies and so on. To sell gin, you have to have a licensed premises now, <laughs> such as alehouses, taverns or inns. Licensed premises. I ain't even got a roof over me head. There's just nowhere to get any. Oh, come on. Come on, surely you've got some spare. There must be some around it. <laughs> Look what I've got. <laughs> Don't bother. I've got me own, I have. Oh, if I could get the lid off it, that would be a grand thing, wouldn't it? I've saved this for such an occasion as this. Well, to gin. Bottoms up, my lovelies. So there we go. Fabulous, fabulous, fabulous. A bit of history there, the history of gin from the lovely Dr. Kate Vigors of History's Made. Um, do check out her website and her Facebook page. Um, you can find her on History's Made on Facebook. Um, and she's doing some live lectures and all sorts of things. And uh, yes, so that was fabulous. I learned a lot about gin. Um, brilliant presentation. Now, coming up, uh, telling you what we're going to be doing next, we're going to take a short break and then at four o'clock, uh, we're going to be back. And we're going to be back with some culture, ladies and gentlemen, some culture. We're going to have um, some, uh, uh, we're going to have a poem and then we're going to have um, some some comic book talk. We're going to be, uh, we're going to be showing a world premiere. We've taken um, a strip from the Return to the Asylum comic book, which uh, some many of you who go to the asylum might well be familiar with. Uh, this is the second one after Enter the Asylum was the first one. And uh, we've taken a strip from that and uh, done something interesting with it. Something you hopefully will all like and it will be fun. Um, and then um, we've got uh, Colin who comes from um, Accent UK who publishes this. He's talking about his favourite comics. Uh, comics with a Scottish feel, I think you'll find. Um, and then uh, we're going to finish that off. There's a, there's a short advert from a writer that you should pay attention to. And then there's uh, some music from Captain Cup of Tea. So that's all coming up in the next segment. And then later on, um, at five, we've got uh, tea dueling, which is going to be fun, live tea dueling. Uh, this is the segment that worries me most. We've got live tea dueling, then we've got live portraiture with Dr. Jeff. So that's going to be interesting. So for now, uh, we're going to take a short break again, and uh, we'll see you again at four o'clock. Now, stay safe, stay splendid. <laughs>